the integration of artificial intelligence into telecom is shaping core facets of the network. And here to discuss AI's transformative power are Abhishek Shankar, president of Tech Mahindra, Raj Yavadkar, CTO of Juniper Networks, Hugh Crean, Chief Architect at 3 Ireland, and Jason Hogg, GM for AI Ops within the Azure for Operators Group at Microsoft. Welcome to all of you. Yep. So I want to start with you, Hugh, because you are actually at the front lines of this process. How has AI influenced customer service and, and your operations? Yeah, um, I mean, the whole area of, I, of AI is very exciting, especially for, you know, call center. Um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, obviously there's a lot of hype. There's a lot of solutions in the market. Um, most mobile operators already have some sort of chat solution. Probably the first entry of AI is those, those chat solutions are now driven by AI. Um, next generation IBR solutions are, in my opinion, going to be transformative. Many, many of them come with, um, you know, dynamic menus, visual IBR capability and AI uh, virtual assistants. Um, so from a call center perspective, it's, it's going to have a huge impact. Um, it's not even so much having AI agents dealing directly with customers. It's um, human agents working collaboratively with virtual assistants and automating a lot of the you know, back office uh, tasks that an agent does today with typing up notes, summarizing cases, raising trouble tickets. A lot of that can be automated and you know, the human can focus on, I suppose, higher value activity. So it's, a, it's an exciting time. Um, from an architecture perspective, we are you know, we're cognizant that we need to uh, move, but move carefully. Uh, you know, there's many cases of AI chats going rogue, et cetera. So we want the governance around it. We want control around it. We've, been, we've all invested a lot of money putting a 360 view of customer in front of the human agent. Uh, we need to make sure we keep that for the, for the AI agent. So we're, we're, we, you know, we don't want different silos of AI. We want to keep it uh, governed, you know, fed with a common data set and, you know, um, so we can control it. But yeah, definitely um, it's going to be an exciting, I'd say within the next year, it's going to be a massive change. In and Raj, how about you? How has AI impacted network operations? So traditionally, if you look at network operations, uh, telecom um, operators would use multiple dashboards to look at different aspects of the network and try to monitor and troubleshoot networks. That's a very manual, labor-intensive process. So what we have done is that we took telemetry from all the aspects of the network, starting from end users, network fabric, network devices. We all collect that in a public cloud and apply machine learning to do correlations across those. So we can automatically find out any anomalies or any troubles. And before those are noticed by the operators, we actually are able to troubleshoot. So one of our customers has publicly stated that 90% of their troubleshooting tickets get self-resolved. Nobody has to intervene. So that's the power of artificial intelligence and machine learning that we are beginning to see in network operations. And Jason, how does your company see AI impacting operations as well? It's amazing. There's probably not an area of operations that won't be affected by AI. Uh, the story that Raj just described is very similar to the journey that many of our customers are on. The interesting challenge, of course, is that the journey starts with data, uh, helping operators break down the silos that have actually existed over the years. Uh, by virtue of the data coming through different network functions, not necessarily having great adherence to common standards. And the cloud's a great sort of great tool for actually breaking down the barriers. Within, within Azure, we've released a new offering called Azure Operator Insights, which is all about sort of helping operate a scale of data, get ingested, moved into the cloud, get managed using a modern data mesh architecture, enable and supervise machine learning techniques like anomaly detection so you can look for sort of idiosyncrasies and sort of patterns that you may not notice otherwise. But most importantly, again, similar to what Raj was saying, take the tickets that usually existed in operating um, in, in operations rooms or customer support teams and actually help validate that the actual issue is real. Make sure that the way it's prioritized is real. And then go back and look at previous RCAs, troubleshooting content, and actually have mitigation guidance integrated into the ticket. 
so that then your operation teams are so much more effective and they're able to actually start thinking about um, you know how to actually you know enable better customer experiences or you know, ideally start thinking about sort of new offerings absolutely so it's very similar and Abhishek you have a very um, unique view from the helm of the ship uh, how do you see AI impacting the competitive environment Sure. So, um, you know, from the helm of the ship, I'll probably throw some statistics to you. What I had an opportunity was to look at several AI proof of concepts. And I just want to differentiate and talk about generative AI and not predictive AI, which, you know, both my colleagues just talked about. Uh, from a generative AI standpoint, what we are seeing creating a competitive advantage is really around call centers and, and customer care. So seven out of 10 experiments today, the way we see globally, at least across our client base, are in the broader customer care, contact care space, and about three out of 10 are in developer productivity. But I do think that when we meet next year at the same time, the conversations will be on generative AI on operations and specifically network operations. If I may, yeah, I, I, you're absolutely right. But generative AI is not necessarily only for call center. We are beginning to see that in network operations. Right. For example, since you get a natural language interface, you can now talk to the network to query the status or give instructions rather than trying to understand the nitty gritty details of scripts, writing scripts, manual operation. So that's beginning to happen. We are already starting to apply that for our products. And like you said, in a year from now, we'll come back and admire the, the rate of progress is just amazing. The, um, I think the natural evolution of that will be that this you know, the, the GPT-based agents could actually be recommending configuration changes, for example, that you'd be mad to actually deploy them unguarded. And that's why sort of the idea of the co-pilot sort of metaphor with the, AI, the agent working alongside the AI-based agents, maybe making a recommended change to the network, but then ensuring that the actual deployment of the configuration change um, adheres to your safe deployment practices. So you've got a phase where to roll it out, test it, stage it, and then deploy en masse. And that's going to be that closing of the loop that we've all been super excited yeah, about for the longest time. I think time. that's big impacts in the, the OSS layer. So if you think of, you know, traditional monitoring architecture where you get alerts flowing down one, one direction and a human, you know, gets on the phone, raises, uh, raises the alarm, you know, there could be an hour before you call people out. So now you can have an AI agent, uh, you know, getting that alert. You can have a, a number of pre, pre-agreed uh, mitigations, steps that can be done to mitigate, you know, reroute traffic, restart a process, you know, kill a server if it's, if it's in a cluster. Um, so you can have like real time intervention, uh, which would actually prevent the outage in the first place. So there's a lot of uh, potential in the OSS side. So I think the interesting thing will be to try to, how do we actually start to determine which of those automated tasks or which of those remediations yeah, be can be done in yeah. an automated fashion yeah. versus those where you do actually still want human in the loop, so to speak. But there's also a learning component. As you said, that it will start acting upon those in a sort of a, a proactive way, but the process will learn continuously. And if, if you're a network operator and if you have multiple networks, you can learn across multiple networks. So one learning can be applied to other, which is also very powerful. And I think the, and the real opportunity, sorry, I think for operators is in general, they've sort of operated in the regions that they operate in. And how do we actually take the, the learnings from one region, share that with operators in another region so that everybody's able to focus on the new business opportunities, the new experiences they want to deliver to their customers, um, I, I think is the, the next opportunity. Yeah. And that's probably something that you're thinking hard about, I believe. Absolutely. And, you know, connecting the tissue, Clarence, to your question on competitive advantage for operators, I, I think... Uh, doing it first versus doing it right. Uh, the latter might be m more of a competitive advantage uh, than just getting heads on with it. So I, I think yeah. building safety and security yeah. and the guardrails around it uh, will be probably one key aspect of competitive advantage. Probably on the competitive um, uh, side of us, the you know campaign management is going to be impacted by AI. So today we're, let's say, fairly standard campaign somebody uh, you get an inbound an inbound contact you know you've got a, a pre pre-agreed uh, offer or ne next best activity that flashes up to the agent um, but in the AI I mean that can be a real-time you know decision making based on data history you know even predicting uh, you know what the customer could potentially 
want. Um, so a lot of potential in the campaign side, upsell, cross-sell, um, is definitely something that uh, we see happening also. One, one application of generative AI in that context is, today the sales process is through some mechanism like Salesforce where you put in a information, you get on a customer call, you finish the call and then you remember what to put in. But if you have generative AI, you can monitor the entire call, automatically populate the Salesforce fields and also rate the call, how successful it was. So you can use it for training again. So sales process is going to drastically change and become a lot more efficient. And Raj, you bring up something really important. Have you contemplated what success looks like? Will that change the way you measure success? Because AI is just like Raj has, has given that scenario, has, has really changed the way you can, can look at data. Well, I, my broader view on the industry is that it's a relatively simple industry. So success is adding new subscribers and controlling churn. At the, so as long as we can drive a sort of a, a correlation between basic business metrics, which I think we are all in a very good position to, uh, at least from my lens, from the operator side of the world, that is. But, you know, from a Juniper lens, you might want to... Uh, yeah, I mean, I think one uh, change that could happen, that you could measure, is that today the operators, the way they operate, suppose you want a new cable service, you want something done for a B2B enterprise connectivity. You file a ticket, it takes two, three days to get the result. But now with generative AI, with the kind of automation you apply, you should be able to do instant on-demand service. Today, the public cloud operators provide that. I don't go to Azure and I file a ticket and wait to here to get a service. But I do that with operators, but it's not necessary. Generative AI will change that. So that's a big measure of success in that. When it comes to the ecosystem that you all operate in, do you worry that your customers or partners aren't keeping up with AI and, and aren't going to be ready for this transformation? I, mean, I think it's the opposite. Every partner has a solution <laughs> that they, you know, what they're pushing and want to sell. So it's kind of like, actually for us, it's, uh, it's about actually deciding what is the best solution or, you know, is there a one size fits all or, you know, back to my point about do we have a single AI engine that's got a 360 view of uh, all the channels or do you actually have multiple? Um, we looked at some IVR suppliers recently and like one of them comes with uh, all the AI engines integrated in the back. So they found that some of the AI engines were better for sentiment analysis, some were better for language. So they actually call different ones depending on the use case. So again, like that's the potential there is, is amazing. I think the interesting thing, I think when it gets to the core network, we've got lots of different network functions being delivered by different vendors. Unfortunately, there's not great either adoption of or adherence to standards. And what that ends up meaning is that you end up in this disaggregated networks with siloed data that actually makes it quite hard. The value proposition for creating generalized AI models is, is just not there because you almost, the, the people that build the AI models almost need to build them for each of the different variants of the functions. And I think, unfortunately, that's one of the things actually limiting the adoption of AI, traditional AI, um, for operators. So one of the things I'm hoping with 5G and as we start thinking about with 6G, a big part of the movement has to be on it. Operators in, in particular, requiring their vendors to publish schemas, publish test data, um, to enable the broader AI ecosystem to actually start to flourish. In addition to the, the obvious sort of GPT-based scenarios that we're basically starting to see early days for. And it'll be the combination of the data, the different AI models, maybe the generative AI, the, the multi-model sort of um, generative AI, being able to then integrate with other AI systems that have been built and create a unified view that, you know, sort of everybody's sort of hoping and hoping for. But going back to your question, there's also FOMO, fear of missing out. So people are jumping on the bandwagon very quickly, but some functions like call center are low-hanging fruit in my opinion. Some will be harder to achieve, and that's where the competitive advantage will be. The people also start differentiating. Uh, but there's a lot more that Jason mentions, like multimodal models. There's so much development happening. Uh, it's, it's states, the state is in flux. I think this FOMO is a absolutely, you know, you can see it in the, it's palpable in every conversation. But I think there's one thing which is different about generative AI versus traditional. I think traditional MIST, for example, it has been doing machine learning for years. So 
some of this has already been there. But when it comes to generative AI, you know, my son who's 10 years old, he tells me more about GPT-4 uh, and its comparison with others. It's out there in the consumer's hand. So a lot of generative AI is ubiquitously present relative to traditional AI, which we didn't know existed, but it always existed in some way or the other. Yeah, but something like Mist AI, which already uses natural language processing, has a head start to start incorporating generative AI. Course, because it doesn't take much to do that. That's an advantage and you have to maintain that. But I think um, uh, go, um, to your earlier point, right? The whole bunch of industries are going to try to transform. And I think it's a pace of innovation will decide how quickly we do. I think the, um, the really interesting opportunity, I think we talked about sort of the obvious applications, making call centers more efficient, operations teams more efficient, maybe even this sort of the dark knock and sort of making operation teams sort of more autonomous. The real question there will be, the operators have got this incredible opportunity to actually start integrating AI into their networks, at the edges of their networks, within the RAN, and start offering that to enable consumer devices to use AI that they may not have before. And this is where so Mobile World Congress this year, was their AI RAN Alliance was actually announced. And so part of their goal is to start integrating RAN into more parts of the network to actually create new business opportunities, new communication sort of um, what would you call it, opportunities for operators to actually um, enable. So. And AI for RAN, the alliance you mentioned, is important because RAN is a very expensive resource. People have spent billions of dollars to enable 5G and they're not being able to monetize it. We all pay the same amount for our iPhone service plan, no matter it's 4G or 5G. So introducing new services that take advantage of AI is imperative. It's really important. And the other opportunity is, you know, from a sustainability perspective, one, you know, one option is to better understand where the power is needed and power down the cells. But a better option would be to actually be enabling new scenarios for consumers that you can monetize. Um, and so that's where things will get really exciting in the coming years. Well, we are definitely at the beginning of something big and we're in good hands with all of you. So thank you very much for being with us today. Very welcome. Thank you. Thank you.